The themes of today's talk are thankfulness, impact, and opportunity. Thank you to the SciPy Organizing Committee, to InThought, and the conference sponsors. Thank you to the Python community for the depth, breadth, and quality of tools and community that are being built. And thank you for the opportunity to convey this information. It's a real distinct honor. Thank you to our team and our partners and all of those who have believed in our mission early on and who continue to support us, including Globus, Globus Labs, Chimad, NIST, the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, and so many others. You'll hear today about a number of impactful scientific stories that are enabled by each of you and the projects that you have maintained for years and those that you will start over conversations at this conference. We'll also talk about opportunity, the opportunity to build vast, new, inclusive, and open research communities, the opportunity to multiply the effectiveness of scientific researchers and billion-dollar facilities, and the opportunity to accelerate scientific discovery for the public good. So a little bit about my background. I'm actually trained as an experimental researcher in material science, specifically in polymers. I did my bachelor's at Elmhurst University in physics and mathematics. Then I moved to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign where I studied autonomous materials or materials that can maintain their own homeostasis without outside intervention. Things like self-healing, temperature regulation, uh, active material deposition for healing, et cetera. But by around 2011, you could really feel that, that everything was changing. Uh, it was becoming obvious that, that data and machine learning methods were going to be driving scientific progress. And you can see that uh, that has sort of come to bear over time as well. So I made a, a rather abrupt career change, and I became a software developer uh, at the Globus team. Uh, I went to work with Ian Foster and Steve Tiki, uh, and I want to thank them, of course, for, <laughs> for taking a chance on a material scientist as a software developer, but also to say that they're uh, the culture that they've built is really reflected in all of the projects that you'll see here today. So from 2013 to 2015, uh, during this transition, I watched so many different SciPy videos. Uh, I put a few on here, but there are so many more. I went back through my history. It was really kind of fun to, to relive all of that. But it, it was extremely helpful uh, during that transition period towards uh, you know moving from being, exper being an experimental researcher to uh, helping to run a computational research group. The goal of our team is to accelerate scientific discovery. So we, we work on several different topics. We work specifically on building scientific software and platform services as foundational research data infrastructure. And we also do applied machine learning and AI to enable new scientific applications in material science, chemistry, biology, high energy physics, and more. So we do that through two different groups. We have the Globus team, which uh, maintains a number of production services that are used by up to 300,000 researchers at this point. And we also have Globus Labs, which uh, maintains our research portfolio and, and, just, and contains many of the projects that you'll, you'll hear about today. So I watched last year's keynote from Fernando Perez, and a couple things really stuck with me. The, the first, of course, was that, that he, he called scientific open source software a foundational public good. And I want to go even further and say that open source software is actually foundational research infrastructure at this point. Um, NumFocus also has this nice tagline of better tools to build a better world. And I, I really resonate with both of those and, and want to you know, say how much I agree with those sentiments. And a number of the projects that we use in, in our work are shown here. Not all of them because they're, they're, there would be hundreds to fill up uh, many, many pages, but the the open source community is really stepping up and, and developing just amazing capabilities that, that, are, that are driving scientific impact today. And, and really, there are opportunities everywhere right now. There are just so many big science and technology problems to solve from health, climate, pandemic preparedness, next generation computing, understanding protein structure, function relationships, energy, Deploy, deploying AI and machine learning, and so many others. And of course, many agencies are, are working on these topics, but there's just still so much opportunity. And we have a lot of the tools we need to make progress on these challenges. So we have large experimental facilities. This is a picture of the Argonne Advanced Photon Source, which is undergoing a $815 million upgrade in 2023. We have the Center for Nanoscale Materials. We have engineering facilities. We also have access to some of the largest computers in the world at, at the DOE labs and also in academia, and of course in the cloud, and, and hundreds of, of smaller labs as well. But I want to come back to this and reiterate that open source software is really a foundational research infrastructure at this point. And, and what I say, when I say that, what I mean is that, that these 
uh, these facilities that we discussed earlier, these billion dollar facilities would just not operate without this software at this point. And so there's there's really an important uh, aspect of, of of the community that's just uh, that's deploying these. And and I think it can be very easy when you're working on a, uh, as part of a small community, perhaps, or working on a, a small issue uh, within a, a particular project. But I want you all to know that you're you're doing things that that in the end are are literally saving lives, creating new economies, and helping to build a sustainable world. And so, so when you wake up in the morning, uh, you don't have to worry or wonder about whether or not what you're doing is important because it already is, and we're already doing these types of things. Uh, and I think that there's just so much room to grow. But it's it's really just an amazing time to be in the open source software community in the Python community, which has just uh, seen full uh, acceptance within the research community. And, and really, as I mentioned, there are just so many big science and technology problems to solve. So I want to focus on three here today. Uh, materials discovery, uh, which has you know importance for uh, climate change, grid resilience, discovery of next generation lithium ion batteries, economic competitiveness, and also protein characterization, which uh, is important for development of antivirals, antibiotics, new therapeutics, drug discovery, uh, pandemic response, and, and much more. And the, the third class here is open and engaging science. And I think there is just an overwhelming amount of latent talent out there that we can engage through citizen science and building new communities that and making those accessible that I think will really revolutionize the community in the next 10 years. So we're, we have our, our talk broken down into three additional stories. As I mentioned, there are these big science problems to solve, and, and we're going to show you some demonstrations that kind of encapsulate each. So the first demonstration will be uh, around the topic of lithium-ion battery electrolyte discovery. And we'll, we'll hear from Logan Ward, Aristana, Skirtas, KJ Schmidt, and, and others uh, around, around that topic. We'll then look at some automated SARS-CoV-2 protein crystallography that was done at the Advanced Photon Source and Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. We'll hear from Ryan Chard, Raf Viscovi, and others. And then we'll hear from uh, Ben Galuski, Jim James, Nathan Prine, and others about MOMENT, a new open science collaboration platform that we're working to deploy. So the first story is about using AI data and open source software to speed materials discovery. A little bit of context, before 2010, the time from discovery of a new material in the lab to usage in products was about 20 years. It was sometimes even longer for things like structural materials that might find application in aerospace. So we, we sort of know that this is far, far too slow for the, the pace of materials discovery that we need for uh, achieving clean energy deployment, quantum computing, advanced energy storage, and next generation communications. In 2011, there was funding set aside to double the pace of materials discovery and deployment. In the, in the United States, this was called the Materials Genome Initiative. There were similar efforts in the EU and Asian countries as well. And what, we, what we've seen over the last uh, you know, 10 years has been uh, essentially the development of a very robust and burgeoning software ecosystem that's shown here on the right. And you see that there, there are many uh, software and services that are, are really keenly developed to help researchers use AI, use data uh, in, in new ways to discover materials in, in a much more rapid way. And so we've seen, as I mentioned, many useful tools developed. We've also seen many notable successes for materials discovery, ranging from new polymeric materials to uh, new metals that have been used and glasses that have been used in, in cell phones and more. And you can, you can read about many of those in this paper here on the right. But, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. And if we think about it, for any given scientific research study that's done, for example, in material science, but also in, in many other domains, uh, you can ask some, some questions. For example, where's the code? Where are the trained models? Where's the training data? How can I reproduce these results? And, and really, what we see is that without having all of these pieces, the progress uh, for the next team is much slower. It's drastically slowed, actually. And you know, the I say this sort of tongue in cheek, but uh, this this burning fire over here shows the location of data sets and models and code that aren't published, and and really we're throwing billions of dollars, perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars a year worth of of data and models into the bin. 
So this brings us to the concept of FAIR data principles. And so FAIR data principles uh, is an acronym for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And really, these are a set of principles that are meant to help uh, the community make data as useful as possible. And you can, you can find out more about each of these data principles here. But essentially, uh, you know, the goal is to make data as reusable and, and, and discoverable as possible. And there are a number of really great groups that are doing work in this area, ranging from this fairsharing.org, Figshare, MARTA, uh, NIST MRR, and the Materials Resource Registry, GitHub, and, and many others are just doing fantastic work to start making data uh, fair. But we still need access to more well-described data and tools. And, and that also includes things that are not just data, that, that could include code, it could include models, and it could, could include things like workflows. And, and beyond that, we actually need to start seeing concrete examples of fair science that are achieving things that couldn't be done otherwise, and also better incentives that help researchers realize why this is important and that they should uh, you know, invest the time to achieve fair within their own research. And so the story today is going to tell a story of a FAIR workflow that, that takes data that is located on the materials data facility uh, and foundry and, and uses Colmena to, to perform a, a molecular screening. And so the foundational capabilities that we'll talk about here are, as I mentioned, the materials data facility, which allows you to publish and discover data, mint permanent identifiers for those data so you can reference them. Also, it includes smart data indexing, so it understands a number of material specific data sets and can allow you to register that information into a search index that makes that data discoverable. Uh, also supports very large data. So we can support data up to you know, many terabytes as for one individual data set. Foundry is another layer that allows you simple access to ML-ready data sets, uh, allows publication and sharing of ML models and functions. And just to show you an example down here, this is an example of how you might access the data from an atom position finding benchmark. You can see there's a very simple API where all you need to know is the DOI for the data set, and you can simply call load on that data, and you fetch that data, and then you can use it. We'll also use Colmena. Colmena will be used to coordinate uh, simulation campaigns uh, on HPC resources, and also it will incorporate active learning and AI to prioritize the simulations that are done. And now we'll hear from Aristana Skirtis, KJ Schmidt, and Logan Ward. Molecular discovery is important across numerous applications. Specifically, the one I'm working with with my colleagues at J. Caesar is to find which molecules out of an incountable number of possibilities will be economically viable for these next generation redox flow batteries that are intended for grid storage. There are a lot of problems in lithium ion batteries that have to do with the non-lithium ion parts of them. Particularly, the molecular part is the barrier which separates the high energy cathodes. Those are the parts that, because they're um, kept separate from each other, we can keep energy stored. And when they contact each other, they release a lot of energy and you get fires. So what we need are these um, interchanges that are simultaneously very easy for lithium to cross. So that when we discharge the battery, we can discharge it very quickly or charge it very quickly, yet impermeable when we want them to be. My research would take years longer if there was not the Python uh, open source community. If it's orchestrating my tasks to happen on computers, the tasks themselves, analyzing the data afterwards, basically everything I have relies on Python being open source and having such a rich community around building libraries on top of it. If you scrape back the layers enough, there are ND arrays at the base of them. Mm -hmm. Occasionally it'll be calling through SciPy, occasionally it will be through scikit-learn, but whatever it is, all of it goes back to that uh, NumPy stack. So I'll be showing you a coupling of some of the tools we've been developing with the materials data facility, namely Foundry, which we're gonna use to access a large resources of potential molecules, along with Colmena, a software that I'm developing as part of the Exascale Computing Project, that will allow us to simultaneously evaluate new molecules uh, using other uh, software from the Python environment, namely QC Fractal, and machine learning tools to be able to identify, given that data, which are the most promising molecules to evaluate next. 
First, we'll use Foundry to load the space of molecules, and we'll load the data with these two line, the two lines of code that I mentioned earlier. So load, and we're using the DOI here to load the data, and then load data loads the data into the client. And you can see here, every Foundry data set is packaged with descriptive metadata. Um, so this makes it not only easier to find the data set you're interested in, because you can search on fields that are included in the metadata, but it also makes it easier for you to know what's in a given data set when you find it, right? It's not just a black box anymore. Um, so here you can see a descriptive title of the data set um, for Moses, as well as authors and the associated DOI. Um, you can also see what kind of keys or columns are involved in this data set. So um, the two main columns here would be the smile strings, which are um, a molecular representation in string form, and the um, inchi uh, identifolicule. And, and as well as we can also see that this data set is meant for an unsupervised machine learning task, um, and it's tabular data. So this gives us a little information about like, how the columns are structured. Now that we have our data loaded, our next task is to write an application which can search through those lists of molecules as quickly as possible. The way that we do that with Colmena is writing an application that switches what the supercomputer is doing depending on the results that it has found so far. For example, the application we're going to show you today switches nodes between running simulations running machine learning training jobs to update the models that we use to pick um, the next simulation to run, and running those uh, models across a very large search space in parallel. Building a Colmena application involves two parts, the first of which is a task server which sits on your computing resource and executes the tasks told to it by a thinker. To build that task server, you must supply it two parts. The first of which use, is a description of the resources available to it. This example we show on screen shows a resource that can run on your local computer. But you can set up a parcel, which is the underlying fabric uh, behind Colmena, to execute on remote systems, such as, as we'll soon demonstrate, the Argon supercomputer. Once you have this computational resources, you provide it to Colmena, along with a list of the methods uh, available to it. For in this particular example, I have a simulation method and two machine learning tasks that will be available to my thinker. Additionally, we also have different compute fabrics available for uh, Colmena, one of which is Funkx, which uses a function as a service model, allowing us to execute tasks across many computational resources without any of the networking problems. What we find is that by using these um, ability of Colmena to switch what those supercomputing nodes are doing, we can get the same scientific result in a shorter amount of time, which means more science and fewer resources. Now we'll deploy this application to Theta. You'll see over time a split between simulation, model training, and inference. You'll also see the best molecules populated here. So as part of this next story, I want to tell you a little bit about the scientific community's pandemic response. Uh, you know, this is just going to focus on, on some of the work that was done within the national laboratories. There are hundreds of other similar stories that you can find from academia. But in 2020, early January, uh, official reports were coming out of a new virus that was emerging in China. And almost overnight, there was really creation of, of communities to start tackling problems of of high interest to the, the national response. And very interestingly, there was an informal Slack that was, was created with about 300 researchers from dozens of DOE national labs, uh, academic institutions, and, and more. This sort of formed overnight, which was, was quite interesting. And it happened very early in the, in the response, even earlier than I think there were cases in the United States. Um, 
And what, what was happening was researchers were sharing information, planning how to increase manufacturing, model the outbreaks, increase testing, design therapeutics, uncover viral protein structures to really sort of understand what was going on. And over time, these, uh, these kind of ad hoc efforts became formalized as the National Virtual Biotechnology Lab and supported hundreds of projects across DOE, uh, which is, it was just an amazing response to see. Our team was involved with a number of uh, projects. The first was collecting and screening billions of molecules against different drug uh, targets. Uh, of course, we all know about Paxlovid, which has been uh, approved and has has seen uh, uh, high performance against SARS-CoV-2. This was the same type of uh, effort that was looking looking to design molecules kind of from the ground up to uh, hit many of these protein targets. We also worked to uh, automate serial x-ray crystallography, which is really important to understand the structure of the, the proteins that are on the surfaces. And this all focuses back into vaccine development and screening of molecules. You need to know the structure of the protein before you can do those things kind of well. The other thing we did was we, we created uh, AI-driven pipelines to extract drug information from literature articles. So trying to see like what people were actually studying. This was a, a big thing at the time was there were thousands and thousands of articles coming out and, and it was really hard to parse what was actually going on. So, so we built some pipelines to extract information about what was happening and kind of display those in near real time. The one I want to focus on is actually around solving protein structures. And so we, we worked to develop a new automation pipeline to collect, analyze, and visualize data, solve the protein structures, and load results into a searchable portal for real-time feedback. And the, the important context here is that all of this was happening while basically the laboratory was shut down, right? There was one scientist that was allowed to be on site. The rest of us were working remotely and trying to, to build these facilities that would allow them to solve these protein structures kind of in record time. And our goal was to achieve uh, 10 times speed up. Uh, but you'll see that, you know, by using uh, these automation flows, we were able to capture data, process data on the Argonne Leadership Computing Facilities Theta system, uh, analyze the images, visualize them, send the feedback back to the, the researcher that was on site, catalog the results, allow them to see what was happening actually in real time. And we were able to uh, you know, solve the structures of a number of proteins, uh, spe specifically at, at room temperature, was which was really important. Many of the other structures were obtained uh, at, at very low temperatures, and these were actually obtained at, at near room temperature which was important to understand like what the actual targets were on the virus for the, the different therapeutics. Um, this, this quote down here in the right actually is something that really uh, resonates with me as well. It, it says, these data services have taken the time to solve a structure from weeks to days and now to hours. And that was by the Beamline scientists that were at APS Sector 19. And I think this really encapsulates very nicely what we were trying to do. And every step of this is actually driven by Python. So the data capture the processing at ALCF, all of the Globus pieces are all uh, are all Python, and many of them are open source. So the story today is is going to to show you what that looked like in near real time. We'll we'll kind of walk you through that. So there's going to be a few foundational capabilities. We have FunkX, which is an NSF supported project that allows you to turn any machine essentially into a function serving endpoint. It also removes the barriers to use. Uh, diverse and distributed infrastructure. So you can use uh, computers ranging from supercomputing facilities all the way down to like a laptop without changing very much. Uh, you, can, you can think of this as functions as a service uh, for, for supercomputing. We also heavily leverage Globus. Globus is a platform that allows you to uh, move data across distributed storage endpoints, authenticate users and groups, build search indexes, build data portals, and more. And of course, the other foundational capabilities that we needed for this were the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, where the computing was happening uh, at, at very high levels. Uh, the Advanced Photon Source, which, as I mentioned, is this facility that has uh, some of the brightest and most brilliant x-rays uh, in the world. And of course, open source software. Every single step of the way, there was open source software involved here. In the second story, we'll hear from Ryan Chard and Rafael Vescovi about an automation flow they built to dramatically speed SARS-CoV-2 protein crystallography with HPC and Python. At the start of COVID, we desperately needed to understand how these COVID structures and COVID crystals were actually uh, 
platform such that we could work toward developing therapeutics. So what we were doing was we were taking images of uh, COVID structures or COVID proteins at the advanced photon source and then outsourcing the analysis to a supercomputer at Argonne's leadership computing facility to provide near real-time feedback on their um, structures. So it's important to notice that when we take these images, they need to be processed and they need to be continuously updated until we get a final result. And the user, the, the beamline scientist, needs to know that a particular, uh, a particular experiment is working or not. So we need to know that this experiment is going well right away. Yeah, there's a huge challenge with optimizing these experiments and getting the most out of your beam time. Uh, you've, it's a pretty uh, scarce resource. So once you've got time on these facilities, you, you really need to be able to utilize your time the best you can. So what we were trying to provide was a way to automatically analyze these data as they're created. And they're creating a ton of data, so we need to outsource it to high-performance computing facilities. Uh, and then actually get feedback to the experimentalists uh, in basically as fast as we can so they can guide whether or not to put the next sample in or whether or not they need to continue processing a specific one to ensure they get the quality of results that they need to derive structures. I think it's important with uh, like the, the need to very quickly accelerate these COVID analyses so we can get toward these therapeutics. Like we, we had to automate the entire process. We couldn't manually intervene between every sample and go back and process these over a period of weeks. We needed to do it in real time. And another challenge was that we had to do it all remotely, right? Like we couldn't even go into the APS anymore. They were only operating with one beamline scientist sitting there and one person delivering the crystal structures. So we needed to be able to provide this remote infrastructure to uh, actually go and analyze these these data as they were created. Our demo uh, goes through data being captured at the APS uh, and then Globus tools, uh, Globus flows, moving that data to Argonne's computing facility, running on-demand analysis, uh, generating statistics of the results, creating plots of how the collection is actually going, and then publishing it into a user data portal where the, the scientists and the users can actually monitor the experiment as it goes. So now we're going to talk about serial crystallography and how to automate the process to deliver the scientists a result in real time. Serial crystallography is a technique that starts in these large scale X-ray machines called synchrotrons, and it uses a very special apparatus to take hundreds of thousands of images of a protein and then mathematically invert it into its 3D structure. The challenge of automation starts on how to integrate the advanced photon source that is going to generate the images and the Argon leadership computing facility that is going to execute the mathematical operations to deliver the user the final result. So how to integrate both sides without the user having to interact with either. So for that, we're going to use different endpoints, one for data and one for processing and then build on top of the Globus Automation platform to orchestrate these transfers and then the processing and ultimately the publishing of this data into a portal. First, we're going to prepare a computing facility to receive the data and the functions that will be used for the processing. And for that, we're going to use a FunkX endpoint to teach our code how to initialize this compute facility uh, that we want to use. Then we are going to prepare an experiment to monitor the file system and transfer the files and trigger the flow once the experiment is running. So you can see the flows now are stored into the Globus Automation platform. And then when this flow is triggered, uh, an execution starts and it gives the user a real time view about what is getting processed. So the last step is to provide the scientists a manner of interacting with the data and inspecting how is it going in real time. This is especially important for these large scale facilities because the time the, that you have to do your experiment is limited and you don't want to waste it with samples that are bad or experiments that are not going well. So here you see an image of like a particular sample and how many hits it have like on each position. And the user can then decide if it's going to continue this experiment or not. So we're going to publish that and also give uh, transfer and download capabilities through the portal. And ultimately, we publish the final room temperature crystal structure on the open database for our protein data. So this is the final step for drug discovery research. Again, from, 
protein, X-ray synchrotron crystallography, supercomputer, Globus Automation Platform to final protein database. Thank you. This third story is around massively scaling scientific engagement. We've heard many stories in the community of students and citizen scientists that are looking for research opportunities to further their own development and contribute to the scientific process, but having trouble finding projects. We've also heard of research teams that need help on many tasks, some small, some domain specific, to speed their projects and not being able to find the right people. And what we've seen is that these matches are essentially being made inefficiently by door knocking, personal communication, or just never made at all. And our question is, what if making such connections was just dramatically simpler? Our vision and indeed our hypothesis is that there exists a latent untapped talent in software development and science that could be harnessed to massively accelerate research and discovery. And so the goals of this would be to open the scientific research process to everyone, enable organic building and supporting of new research teams to tackle some of the hardest problems for society, and to train a new generation of scientists in uh, this decentralized scientific process that will become more and more prevalent. So we're, we're starting to work on the Moment platform. With the Moment platform, we're building uh, the, a service to essentially aggregate opportunities, tasks, and contribution information. You see here on the right, we have a project that is looking to develop models for high throughput electrocatalyst screening. You have a description of the work that you're looking for, some key tasks. You have information about the team, team meetings uh, for mentorship, for example, uh, which is very helpful to building a, a true community around the problem. We're also looking to connect science and engineering opportunities intelligently with those contrib contributors so they have the right projects and right tasks to contribute to. We're also looking to facilitate team creation, communication, and mentorship that is so important to train the next generation of scientists. And also, we're looking to build a way to credit uh, micro-research contributions to help researchers build a profile, as shown here on the right, that allows them to show off all the research they've done, the contributions that they've made, and see progress over time, and perhaps use that as a, a stepping board to get into uh, a research position in academia or, or elsewhere. Next, we'll hear from Ben Galuski and two undergraduate researchers, Nathan Prine and Jim James. And so at NCSA, we often have um, software projects that really could use some assistance. You know, there's a lot of developers here, but there's still a lot of things that would just be fantastic to have uh, outside contributors to our projects that could really help the science. And so we can load them into Moment and use that to, to find high school students, undergraduates, uh, anybody who has software skills and would like to apply them to science. So many people go trolling through uh, GitHub projects looking for issues, and maybe they see one that even says, good first issue. But a lot of times, you're working in complete isolation, and it's difficult to find the developers or get time from the developers of the, you know, like the core developers of the project. And so it's very difficult to make progress. And part of what we're doing with Moment is trying to really build more community around the contributors. I think having something like Moment where you can just take a project on and show like show your worth by being able to complete it but instead of having to go through all these hoops just to get on the project would be really exciting for people trying to break their way into research the first time. From my experience at Argonne, that things can go over a lot longer time frames, but then some things are a lot shorter time frames. So being able to kind of say, oh, I have only just a little bit of time. I can do this sort of thing, as opposed to starting to get involved in a project and then you're continually working on that project for a very long time is something that would be very nice as well. It's kind of hard in the research world to verifiably show your contributions. So pretty much the only way that your contributions are proven are through like an advisor letter of recommendation or perhaps like an interview or something like that where someone is really teasing it out of you to determine what exactly it is that you did on a research project. Even authorship, for instance, doesn't necessarily imply who did what. So I think with something like a platform like Moment where you can kind of see who's actually doing tasks is very useful in that regard where it does give you this sort of portfolio and shows what exactly you're actually contributing to projects. So I think that... Um, having this mentorship and being able to involve myself in research early on in my career was incredibly beneficial to me. And 
if that were available to more people, I think that would be very impactful. The Moment story is still being written. Ethan Shondorf, Ben Galuski, and a number of others have helped us build a prototype platform. This platform allows users to create projects, create tasks, assign credits, and even has simple user profiles. We've also started onboarding scientists from a number of research institutions, and we're working with potential partners at this point to expand even further. At this point, if this sounds interesting to you, we're really looking for collaborators to help make this platform a reality. So please get in contact with us. There's so many other stories that we didn't get to tell today, including the story of real-time black hole merger event detection that we're working on with LU Huerta, AI-guided weather prediction and accelerated climate models that we're working on with Scott Collis, Bobby Jackson, Max Grover, and others, and also AI-guided electrocatalyst discovery and screening that we're working on with Rafa gomez Bombarelli, Kripa Varanasi, and others. We're also exploring a number of concepts in self-driving laboratories, where we seek to build AI-driven autonomous robotic experimental facilities, automate data capture to train predictive models, and to create closed-loop systems to speed discovery in biology, material science, chemistry, and more. And you can see below the great team that has been established at Argonne to explore these concepts. I want to come back to this concept of open source software as foundational research infrastructure. In the coming decades, scientists will make unimaginable breakthroughs with these facilities. We already know that. Nobel Prizes will be won. Cures to diseases will be discovered. We'll better understand our climate and weather. And new materials will make energy abundant and transportable. And we know that we're part of that process. We know why we work late on that pesky bug or PR review. Because all of this depends on us, and we answer the call. Because science runs with Python. We're eager to engage this community, and since we weren't able to be there in person this time, we're holding special Zoom office hours July 13th, 9 to 5 p.m. Central, and July 14th, 9 to 5 p.m. Central. You can also schedule a special time to meet with us uh, via Twitter or by email, and those are shown below. All of the relevant links, including the Zoom link uh, for this presentation, are included on the GitHub linked above, github.com slash blazik slash scipy. We look forward to talking with you. I want to say thank you to the team and our many partners. I want to say a special thank you to Ian Foster and Kyle Chard, who have been steadfast and inspiring collaborators on all of these projects. And without them, none of this would have been possible. Thank you also to the rest of the team, to Globus, to Chimad, and so many others. Thank you all. Thank Ben. Thank you. So um, can we switch over to the Zoom link for Ben? Awesome. Thank you, Ben. That was a great talk. Uh, we've got a few questions on the Slack channel. Andrew Reed asks, for the near real-time HPC on beamline data in the COVID project, was it sufficiently close to the real-time, to real-time, to actually a steer the experiment in response to HPC results. Is this a near-term goal? Great talk, thanks. Can, can you hear me, Ben? Am I on mute? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> there, I, I can hear you now. You can hear now. OK, let me reread the question. Uh, Andrew Reed asks, for the near real-time HPC on beamline data in the COVID project, was it sufficiently close to real-time to actually steer the experiment in response to HPC results? Is this a near-term goal? Great talk, thanks. Yeah, thank you. It was really fun to put that together. Um, yeah, it, it was it was definitely close enough to real time to steer the experiment. So, you know, generally uh, when people are, are running this, these experiments, they take the data home and analyze it over maybe a week or more. And this was this was done, like I said, near real time. So uh, definitely less than the time it would take to change a sample out. That's great. Um, really, really impressive. 
Uh, Andreas Mueller asks, how do you think we can convince NSF that spends millions of dollars on research infrastructure to spend even a fraction of that to help develop critical software infrastructure like the SciPy stack? I know that's not a popular question here, but still, I feel we need to ask it, so. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think one, one thing that, that we're looking to do over the coming, coming year or so is really uh, develop a, a site that con condenses all of the, these stories into a place where these types of funders can go and look at them. And I think the thing that's going to convince them is seeing, seeing these stories and realizing that without, without the SciPy stack that you're talking about, that they're not going to happen. Um, so, so certainly we're, we're open to helping, you know, on the science side to collect those stories, promote that within the community and also to talk to the program managers, because as you mentioned, I think it's it's absolutely critical that that we get more funding for the uh, you know software infrastructure. That's great. Um, I I think all of us hope that uh, there's success in that arena. Um, not unrelated, uh, Juan Lu asks. Uh, we've all suffered from the lack of source code and other artifacts in published research, which, as you said, slow progress down. However, even if journals are nudging researchers to make their inputs, quote, available upon reasonable request, the harsh reality is that most of such requests are ignored, between 50% and 90% depending on the field. There clearly is a problem of incentive alignment. What else can we do to change a system that is hardly working for anyone, except perhaps for journals that charge disproportionate amounts? Not provocative at all. <laughs> no, that, that's one of my least favorite phrases that I read in a paper is, uh, you know, data or models available upon reasonable request. And I, I've seen that paper that he referenced with, uh, you know, 90% not responding or something like this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a big problem. I, I think, you know, incentive-wise, there's lots to do around how do we uh, ensure that, that people see data sets and code as, as first-class citizens within the, the research ecosystem. But, you know, also as reviewers of articles, we can push back when, when somebody uh, submits an article and doesn't provide their data sets and code. And I know a number of researchers in materials and chemistry are, are now just outright rejecting things if they don't provide those, because how can we actually validate anything? And nowadays, you know, the, the stack is there to share your data sets and code. You have GitHub for your code, you have you know, materials data facility for your, your materials data, you have Zenodo, all sorts of places where you can put your data. It just comes down to you know, getting people to actually do that. Uh, absolutely, I, I, and I, I personally, I find that as a cultural thing, as a reviewer, it's sort of like, I mean, can I really reject on this basis? But I, I think that's really what it needs to come down to. I, that's at least one element of what needs to yeah. happen. Um, so I, I had a question maybe sort of orthogonal to that as I was thinking about this. Um, I think the incentives do need work. I think there are, as many of us have probably encountered, there are definitely challenges in devoting sufficient effort into tool development and infrastructure and the sorts of activities we're doing here if one wants to live an academic lifestyle anyway and making it fit there. Um, it looks like your team at, at Globus and in, within Chimad and Argon and so on have had some success there. Do you have any advice or is it maybe not as successful as it appears, but do you have any advice on how people should approach things uh, to do it right, to get the APIs well developed, to get the documentation, to get the support for tools and so on, beyond just simply attaching your code to a publication. Yeah, you know, I think we've, we've seen a lot of people successfully, um, you know, create repositories that people can reuse. We've seen people using Google Colab, which is, is really helpful. So you put your notebook on GitHub, you can just run it on Google Colab. All of your software dependencies are sort of handled if, if people set it up properly in the first place. Um, you know, on, on our side, I think, I think it comes down to talking to a lot of people, like to get the APIs right and the software right, to get usage, to understand what people actually want. You have to get in there and talk to people. And I think, uh, you know, we talk to hundreds of people and we send out many, many cold emails and hear lots of things that uh, don't come back positively, but you really have to get out there and talk to people to figure out what you're going to build. And I think that has been part of our success is just kind of repeatedly going out there and knocking on doors and 
uh, trying to get people to tell us one what they want, but also to you know share their code and and get these success stories out there. Find any particular successful strategies in engaging with management on these sorts of things, or or did you need to use these tools to boost H index? And uh, are the were the merits of the tools evident on their own? Oh, that, that's actually a good point. I, I I didn't circle back around to that, but you know, some of the more successful times that we've interacted with uh, groups has been through large centers. So if a large center sort of decides that that they want to make all of their data available. Uh, you know, there can be some carrot and stick from the center itself uh, to make that happen. And we, we've seen, you know, centers that are $20 million centers that decide that every single paper that comes out has to have their data on, you know, MDF or, or shared somewhere. And then you actually see that happen. And you see, you know, 60 or 80 publications come out pretty quickly. And I think that's the type of, you know, com small community that's being built that, that helps people, uh, decide that that needs to happen. Another question from George Mullenbrock here. Without wishing to sound cynical, are the processes in place for managing the global software ecosystem and its participants robust enough to avoid the failings that have evolved in the social media sphere? I don't know. Their failings in the social media sphere? I'm not. I, I haven't heard anything there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, certainly the. I think the software ecosystem is so diverse. It's it's quite different than than social media, where just a few giants kind of play an outsized role. So so certainly there will probably be projects that have issues, but I suspect that you know they'll get weeded out over time. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not sure how else to answer that one. Ben again. Sorry. Let's thank Ben again. Uh, really great talk. <laughs>